Hello, and welcome to Episode 7 of the LCLC Podcast. In this episode, I talk with the noted poet and critic Norman Finkelstein, who has been regularly attending LCLC conferences since 1982. Emeritus Professor of English at Xavier University in Cincinnati, Norman is the author of 13 books of poetry and six books of literary criticism. He is widely published in the fields of modern poetry and Jewish literature. Among his critical books are On Mount Vision, Forms of the Sacred and Contemporary American Poetry, University of Iowa Press, 2010, and Like a Dark Rabbi, Modern Poetry and the Jewish Literary Imagination, Hebrew Union College Press, 2019. He writes and edits the poetry review blog, Restless Messengers, at www.poetryinreview.com as well. Our wide-ranging discussion began with Norman answering the question I like to ask all our guests. Just what do you remember about attending your first LCLC conference? Well, if I'm not mistaken, it was in 1982. And that was a year or maybe two years at the most after I joined the Xavier faculty. So I was delighted to discover that it was a relatively short drive, you know, down the pike to get there. And I believe the paper that I gave at that time was on Helen Adam. And uh, it would have been, material would have been derived from my first book, The Utopian Moment, which was at that point, you know, beginning to cook. Um, I was terrified of giving papers at that point. Um, I was, you know, very young. I was very much, you know, an, an assistant professor. Uh, I knew that it was important and I wanted to to air the work that uh, that I was doing. I believe the the cultural theorist Paul Smith was chairing the panel that I was on. Um, I had known his work a little bit and was equally terrified of him. Um, the panel may have been uh, on Marxism and literature, because as we say nowadays, I identified as a Marxist back then, um, though a very utopian one, uh, which I still am. So um, I don't recall how big the audience was. I don't recall you know, the amount of conversation, probably very little because nobody was familiar with Ellen Adams' poetry. But I do remember that uh, my feeling that this was a wonderful forum and this this could be s uh, an event that I would attend regularly. Mm -hmm. I, I don't recall if it was that year, but um, one of the early years of my attendance, so this would have been the mid-80s mid or even early 80s, I was very excited because Robert Coover was the um, guest reader. Uh, you know the, the the featured the featured author, um, and I was you know very much a fan of his work at that time. Probably less so now. Um, so you know another wonderful thing about the early years was the chance to hear writers who I really admired. So in subsequent years, you continued to attend the LCLC after your paper on Marxist utopian poetry? Definitely. Uh, one, one of the things that has always attracted me to the conference is, well, because it's, it's, it was so nearby also, it was, it was a way for me to test new critical material. And uh, I always drew from the work that I was doing, which is to say over many years, the books that I was writing, I always was able to you know, extract 20 minutes worth of material, turn it into a paper and run it by you know, a small but often very knowledgeable audience and test the work. Um, mm -hmm. 
you know, test test its viability, test you know, test whether it was having an impact or not. Mm -hmm. And do you did you have you had the chance to read your poetry or creative work at the conference? Well, you know. Well, I'll just I'll just like you know put my cards on the table as far as that goes. There there were a number of years when I sent uh, creative submissions, and they were not accepted. <laughs> and, That's interesting. And I don't you know I mean, er, early on in my <clears throat> career, you'll pardon the expression, I was probably known more as more as a critic than as a poet. I mean, the, uh, even though I was writing poetry and and thinking of myself primarily as a poet, um, I was doing work that was, and I've said this before, um, that was maybe a little too strange, or for what was what was seen as the mainstream, and a little too mainstream for what was seen as the avant-garde. So. I have a feeling that people were not able to like get a handle on my work that came, you know, years later. Uh, so most of the time I just said, you know, the heck with this, you know, I'm, I'm going to do a critical paper and I know that my criticism is solid, you know, and I'm, and I'm going to be able to go to the conference. Right. Did you take advantage of the, uh, let's call them the extracurricular opportunities to read poetry at Alan Golding's house or back at the Brown Hotel or? Definitely. I mean, once that started, um, I, I, I mean, I, I've, I've never read at the Brown. That was only for a few years. And I don't know if, if Ken Taylor and company are, are still planning to do that. Um, that was sort of in support of, of their wonderful little press, you know, Three Poor, three poor Press um, and Selva Obscura. But no, I mean, you know, by the time Alan started having, you know, uh, post conference parties and readings, I was I was very much part of a you know, a circle of people who um well, were friends with Alan, hung out with Alan and and so yeah, I definitely read and there were recordings of of those uh, on Pen Sound actually. Mhm. Mm um, Is there a particular reading that is a favorite memory of yours from those experiences? You know, I don't know if I could put my finger on it. There, there's, there's some that were that were really a lot of fun, and I just remember people laughing and joking, which was good because some of the poems I was reading were like supposedly funny. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, but really, what stays with me during those events, you know, in regard to those events, was. Um, uh, the camaraderie of it and, you know, the friendliness of it. Uh, of course, there were people at the party who, uh, you know, wanted to party and didn't want to listen. So, you know, we kind of, Alan moved them to another room or something. Um, but uh, that's, that's really what I remember most about those, about those events. Um, right. It is true, particularly, I think, with my own experiences with trying to write something that strikes a humorous chord that you, the only way you can really know if that's working or not is, is to have an audience and see whether indeed they, anyone finds it funny or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, in, in my poetry, there's, there are, there's a, there's a lot of strange humor that some people might not get or might not think is funny, but I just think is funny. Uh, and that's been the case now for, you know, for, for quite a few years, but um, I certainly don't think of myself primarily as a humorous poet <laughs> by mm -hmm. any means. <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Ironic perhaps, but not funny. Mm -hmm. Do you have memories? You mentioned Robert Coover and uh, and your interest at the time in that sort of uh, ex I think I think of him as an experimental and oftentimes funny, actually. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, prose writer. Tremendous satirist. 
tremendous. Yeah, and a satirist. Are there memories that you have um, from your experience listening and having a chance to talk to other poets uh, during these conferences that are fond memories for you now? You know, I had a feeling you were going to ask me that. And one of the ones that I think is is still very warm for me was the one chance that I had to meet W.S. Merwin. Uh, so this goes pretty far back. And I think at that time, Tom Byers, whom I had become friends with, um, probably helped arrange Merwin coming to the conference because Tom had written, you know, a, a third of one of his books uh, about about Merwin. And uh, not only did he read, but I had the opportunity to talk with him a little bit. And, you know, I mean, he's he's not incredibly high on my list, you know, of, of you know, Im important 20th century poets, but there were poems of his that have always moved me. And, and um, I remember we were talking about poetry and prophecy, which is an important uh, matter for me. And I, I, I told him that um, his poem, um, Second Psalm, The Signals, uh, which I read as an undergraduate in a creative writing course years before, was just an incredibly moving and 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 scary and uncanny poem for me and, and deeply steeped in a sense of uh, of the prophetic. And, and he was just like, oh, really? Uh, um, and I don't recall if he actually read it after I mentioned it to him. I think he might have. You know, that I, my feeling is he had not planned to, but that he dug it out and read it. Um, anyway, um, that that was an encounter that, that meant a great deal to me at the time. Um, so, you know, I would never have been able to meet him, you know, had it not been for the conference. Mm -hmm. I did mention in our preliminary email that in interviewing Stanley Fish and Jane Gallup real recently, that they were unable to remember the substance of their talks. And we were able to get a beat on them through mm -hmm. figuring out how the published work came out later. But do you feel that poets and creative writers value the opportunity to read and perhaps therefore remember these experiences more than scholars, academics, and theorists? Mm, not necessarily. I, I think that, you know, depending on, on the work that one is doing in a conference setting, you know, a, a poetry reading or a lecture, a talk, you know, whether, you know, theoretical or critical, um, it can have equal impact. Uh, I mean, for me, there are moments when, um, you know, I mean, I heard Nate Mackey read, but he was, he's been down in Louisville a number of times now. And, you know, I mean, his readings are always just galvanizing to me. But then there have been, you know, talks given by critical theorists over the years and critics that I found just tremendously stimulating and because they, because they were people I wanted to hear. Um, or they were people I had not heard of, you know, who were offering me new perspectives. So, you know, I'm a poet critic, <laughs> you know, um, I mean, I think of myself primarily as a poet, but God knows I've written a great deal of criticism <laughs> over the years. And um, I'm, I'm really open to both experiences. And, you know, I mean, I, I, I love listening to a, a, a good, organized, well put together lively talk as much as a poetry reading. Mm -hmm. I, well, I, I guess I saying they swing both ways. I don't know. <laughs> right, right. Is there a question or a, uh, a story or, or a memory that 
at this point in our conversation is something you want to share that we haven't gotten around to bringing up? Well, let me let me say this um, about the conference in general. Um, it, it it has always meant a great deal to me um, because of its relative intimacy, and I think that's that that's very important. I mean, it's always I stopped going to like the MLA convention so that you know after a certain point because I just felt like like I was being steamrolled you know <laughs> they're just they're just so big and and um and and just kind of overwhelming but louisville has always maintained a certain um uh intimacy and 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 kind of usable size for me and over the years i've developed you know a set of friends who attend regularly too um and they're and they're poet friends you know, and and you know, we get a chance to talk about about the issues that that most concern us, um, and of course, I mean, you know, this is this is unbelievably um, kind of self flattering to me. But you know, back in when was it, 2017? You know, there were a couple of panels of, about my work, um, and you know, I thought that oh wow, you know, now I've re really reached the pinnacle here. You know, they're talking they're talking about me. Whereas in the past, I've been talking about others, um, you know, and, and that, that was just so nice, um, you know, aside from it being very humbling. And now there's now there's a book, you know, based on those panels. Um, and that's very humbling, too, and, and, and lovely. Uh, so I don't think that that could have been done with the same degree of ease, you know, or the celebration of any of a number of other poets who have been celebrated uh or writers who have been celebrated at the, at, at the conference in that way um i have a memory uh and this is not all that long ago when when um colson whitehead um was the featured reader you, you probably remember that yes and a a, col a colleague of mine um at xavier um who had written about his work you know came down and i was in the audience of her panel i wanted to hear what she had to say and in strolls Colson Whitehead, right? You know, and she's thinking, she told me this after, she's thinking, oh my God, you know, there there he is, and I'm talking about his work. Um, she's a bit of a fangirl, I guess you could say. Uh, but um we're that doesn't happen all the time in bigger conferences. And, and you know, and there was just such a a, a a warm feeling about the whole thing. And of course, you know, he spoke to her afterwards, and it was a very lively exchange. Um that's the sort of stuff that I most associate with 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 the Louisville conference. Mm -hmm. And that that's very important to me. Yeah, I agree. In handing over the reins to me, Alan Golding, who's a mutual friend of ours, mm -hmm. he shared with me as a template, really, a a letter to extend to the uh, to to a guest speaker that we wish to bring in. And in looking over the letter and adapting it to my uses, I saw that he characterized the conference as a conference on poetics. And I was wondering if I could get you to talk a little bit about whether you think there is a a a shared perhaps acknowledged sense of what people talk about when they come to Louisville and talk about poetics. Yeah. I would say that on one level, the talk about poetry and poetics at Louisville is a, is a microcosm or a reflection of, of what's going on on the poetry scene you know, more broadly, you know, dare I even say nationally, since, since poetry is at times so local these days. But I also think that, uh, for, again, this is for me, over the years, um, certain tendencies have emerged. Now, let me back up. 
is the Louisville Conference primarily about poetics? No, I don't think so. I mean, I still think it's about modern and contemporary literature, you know, I mean, the, the, the whole gamut. Um, but I also think that it has developed a, spe a special, uh, a certain niche has come into being in, in Louisville that has to do specifically with poetry and poetics. Um, at times it has been um, testy uh, and, and volatile. Um, you know, people have, people have butted heads um, o over various poetic issues. For me, um, even though it has always been a very jokey thing, um, there is the emergence of what has come to be called the new Gnosticism. Um, and, you know, which really started as a joke at, at, at the Seelbach bar, uh, but it also signifies a set of, broadly speaking, poetic values and interests um, among a number of us. Um, and that has been interesting. And indeed, there was a panel on the, on the new Gnosticism. I mean, after it had been invented, it came into being. Um, and we, we did a panel on it. Um, I can't recall how many years back at this point, but uh, those papers were then published um, online in uh, the journal Talisman. Um, so I think that poetic perspective, however um, loosey-goosey it might be, emerged out of Louisville. I mean, mm. and, 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 it, and it emerged um, from uh, a bunch of like-minded folk getting together and talking about these these particular poetic concerns. Um, Gnosticism in the sense of, of um, I don't know, spiritual insight, a fascination with, with the hermetic, um, perhaps even the occult, various um, esoteric and mystical re um, religious uh, um, traditions, and the way in which um, that has shaped the poetic of uh, a, a number of folks who attend the um, the conference regularly. Mm -hmm. I can see that, and I can see uh, easily how, having read read your work and and being a fan of your work, how you would be a, a principal voice within that conversation, in terms of the thematics of that conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How does that extend out into discussion of the craft of poetry where we talk about formal versus free verse and meter and so on and so forth? Or or does that not play into the conversation as much these days? Well, if it doesn't, it should, <laughs> as, as far as I'm concerned. Um, be, because however far afield I wander in um, in my criticism, I'm 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 kind of a I'm kind of still a new critic in a lot of respects. Um, I wouldn't call myself a formalist in any way, but I'm very very concerned about poetic form, uh, and I don't know how much you know this is a matter of discussion. Um, panel for panel, paper for paper in Louisville. But certainly for me, you know, when I, you know, like I'm running this poetry review blog now, I've been doing that for over a year. Um, most of the pieces have been written by myself. It's kind of my post-retirement project. And however interested I might be in the thematics of a given book, I'm always talking about you know, the, its formal concerns and looking very closely at individual poems. Now, you can't really do that to the same extent in a conference paper. Mm -hmm. um, I think that means that you're going to shift more towards an interest in, in, in thematics when um, when you give a paper, um, e even in, even in a, a small conference like like the Louisville conference. Um, but I, for one, remain very, very interested in questions of, of form. Uh, I won't use the word craft, though, of course, it would be a valid term, because I think craft is a term that has been um, appropriated, you know, by, by 
creative writing programs, which I have very mixed feelings about. Um, but nevertheless, you know, formal matters are extremely important to me. Mm -hmm. And thinking about this conversation and having uh, prep for the our conversation by rereading the ratio of reason to magic, and I came across a poem that is dedicated to Harold Bloom, and I mm -hmm. had the opportunity to study with Bloom uh, in like 89, 90. Um, and uh, it was certainly a transformative ex experience for me. And I can remember that one of the poets that we read uh, was was James Merrill. And at that same time, or maybe a year earlier, I had been fortunate enough to attend a a reading <clears throat> that he gave of part of the Changing Light at Sandover mm -hmm. with I believe David Jackson is the, the the name of his partner that was also reading with him at that time. And uh, and so for me, these questions intersect in my memory in terms of the centrality of of form to Merrill's project you know, uh, in terms of how it interlocked with the, these sort of occult visions that dominate uh, the changing light at Sandover and Bloom's um, desire to, to, to think through him as a kind of um, modern synthesis of Blake and Alexander Pope, oddly enough. Oh, yeah. Uh, that, that but, makes perfect sense. Yeah, yeah, uh, it, it does, you know, and I wonder if if that sort of um, that sort of uh, need to reaffirm the importance of of that kind of technical component of poetry. Do you see that? today amongst those poets that you admire and that you know or is is that something that's that is something of a of, of a, a now dormant strand in contemporary american poetry well all right let me let me answer that by by speaking about two poets whose work i know very very well um one of them much more well known than the other. Um, I just finished reading and writing a, a brief review of Nate Mackey's uh, little book, um, which was a lecture originally called Breath and Precarity. Um, you know, and, and, and Mackey's extraordinary knowledge of, of jazz and um, uh, long tradition of, of um, black literature and uh, world music, you know, has shaped his poetic from the get-go and in very deep and fundamental and I dare say influential ways. And, you know, they are um, very remote from, you know, uh, traditional English prosody. And yet they are, they are um, just, just an, an extraordinary, um, synthesis of, you know, the, the new American concepts of free verse that, that are developed, you know, out of pound and then into Olson and Duncan and Creeley and, and those guys who are also very important to me. Um, and uh, the, the sound um, of, uh, of jazz and the jazz traditions that, that Nate knows so intimately. And, you know, this is, this is breakthrough work of a very, very high level um, with an extraordinary awareness of, of formal matters. And then you can contrast that to my, one of my oldest friends, who was my first creative writing teacher, Henry Weinfield, um, 
who is also doing dazzling work, but isn't nearly as well known. And he is a very traditional formalist. I mean, he writes sonnets and he writes terza rima. Um, and, you know, he'll, he'll work in all sorts of complex forms. And um, he maintains that he maintains that tradition. He is, as far as I'm concerned, one of the foremost workers in that tradition um, and demonstrates its continued importance. Mm -hmm. And he always holds my feet to the fire still, you know, I mean, like 50 years later, um, you know, he's going to ask me questions about form when I show him a new poem. Uh, right. So, I mean, you know, a, a, a wide variety of, of those kinds of um, matters, which are are what poetry is. I mean, they're 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 still operative in mm -hmm. all sorts of ways. Yeah. I wanted to ask you a, a question. If I had to think about things that you've been in your reading around and promiscuous uh, reading. You you return again and again to the rabbinical tradition and to the the tradition of 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 Yiddishkeit and and storytelling mm -hmm. uh, that that is in the uh, perhaps Ashkenazi Jewish tradition and I was wondering if I could ask you to talk a little bit about how that came to be and whether you see yourself as a member of a uh, a sort of a generational group, perhaps a couple of generations of American Jews who are fellow travelers in in that um, in that move. I am I am a Jewish poet who writes in English. Um, I have very, very rudimentary knowledge of, of Hebrew and Yiddish. Very rudimentary. Um, in, English is mama lotion to me. And when I began writing poetry, the idea of bringing Jewish material of any sort into it was, would have been a very strange notion to me. Um, but I became increasingly interested in um, Jewish culture, Jewish literature, um, when I started teaching at a Catholic school. <laughs> uh, no, seriously, that really, you know, I, my sense of, of being, you know, part of, of, of the culture, but also other than the culture, was made very strong um, when I started teaching at Xavier. Um, and uh, I was actually encouraged uh, to to um, possibly teach some kinds of Jewish literature courses, uh, which was lovely. Um, and at that time, I was also I was I was reading Harold Bloom. Um, from Harold Bloom, I went on to reading Gershom Sholem and Walter Benjamin, and um, people like that, you know, think thinkers of that sort. The European modernist tradition was extremely important to me. I was beginning to read Freud um, deeply as well. And um, but I was and from there I was reading Kafka. I was reading Isaac Babel. You know, I was reading Bruno Schultz, but I was also reading Cynthia Ozick. I was reading Philip Roth, um, Bernard Malamud, you know, Bello. And, and all of this was kind of percolating. Um, and then, you know, at that time also, um, Jeffrey Hartman and his collaborator brought out uh, that extraordinary collection of essays on mid-Russian literature, um, which was fundamental to me. And people were talking about the connections between um, Jewish textuality and, and post-structuralist theory, a la Derrida, all of this was kind of percolating, you know? Um, and I began to write Jewish poems. Lo, lo and behold, I started writing Jewish poems. You know, poems derived from Singer, poems derived from Kafka, you know. Um, at a certain point, I decided to rewrite the Passover Haggadah. Um, 
and this is over like a 10 or 15 year period. Um, and interestingly too, it was when I began to write that kind of poetry that it began to get published a little bit more. And to this day, I am very grateful to uh, Bob Boyers at, at Selma Gundy, who was publishing, it seems to me, one poem after another of mine on those themes. Um, and that is how, you know, my first full length collection of poems came about, Restless Messengers, um, which was chosen for the Georgia series by um, um, Robert Haas. So I came to be identified, you know, as a poet who, you know, was was walking through a Jewish terrain, and inevitably I began to write about other Jewish poetry. Um, and this is also connected to my long, long, long-standing interest in the objectivists, who not accidentally were Jewish in various ways as well. And some of my earliest published criticism, you know, was on those those poets. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's how it happens. Um, and uh, to this to this day, even when I seem to be writing poems that might be remote from from Jewish culture or my Jewish Jewishness, it comes creeping in. You know, it's 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 part of my imaginary. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean it's 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 who and what I am. It's it's you know it's woven into the fabric of my relationship to to reading and writing. Mm -hmm. Now you want to call that rabbinic? <laughs> if, if you had suggested to my mother that I might become a rabbi, she would have been scandalized. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I as as a young as a young man growing up the my i grew up in a household where neither my mother nor my father went to college and i always sort of considered us deli jews i used to call it you know we we you bang on the table and you get into an argument um but you you have your opinion uh, and and so they they didn't go to college but their kids went to college and there were always books lying around Although they were often sort of reader condensed, right? Uh, Reader's Digest condensed <laughs> novels, um, but when somebody likes when Saul Bellow won the Nobel Prize, it it was my parents were so proud of that that and the whole community was so proud of that. I it it felt like when Elie Wiesel came and gave a talk at the Norfolk Jewish. Uh, community center at the JCC, you know, my parents bought every book and came up there with a stack and said, autograph every single one of them to all my children. And it, it, that, that tradition primed me for asking the question that I just asked you for this sort of powerful cathexis, I called it, yeah, um, in these two traditions. Do you think that that's still a vital connection or do you think that's going to fade this connection between jewish culture and secular american poetry and and art i don't think it is i i i i don't i don't think it is i think i think it's very vital it it might be somewhat insular but i think it's still very vital um i guess you know that that you know i mean any day now we're going to have this uh, new book of poems of mine that i wrote in collaboration with you know uh, a, a younger jewish poet um Tirza goldenberg um which is about the the deepest dive into jewishness i've ever done in in poetry um now, who's going to read it? I don't, I don't know, but we've we've decided to to have extensive notes in the back, which is something I ordinarily don't do in my books, um, you know, in order to 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 help you know non-Jewish readers or even some Jewish readers, you know, to. Um, but the point is that um, it's still a very very important. Um, uh, cultural stream you know and, and i think it remains so in american letters 
Now it's complicated these days by younger folks um, increasing ambivalence to Zionism and Israel. Um, but it's going to get worked out in the same way it was worked out, you know, when when Philip Roth wrote Operation Shylock. Um, still a very relevant book these days. Uh, but, um, you know, and, and for Tirza, uh, my collaborator, Cynthia Ozick remains incredibly important. Um, and we, we talk in the new book about how in some ways it may well be an exemplar of what she called back in the 70s, the new Yiddish. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I, I, I think it's chugging along. It might not be, you know, as quite as noticeable as it was during the generation of, of Roth and Bellow and Malamud, but I, I, I think it remains very, very strong. And, and I'm doing my, my best to, to, um, to advocate for it. Are there thoughts or stories or comments that you wish to shoehorn into this podcast before we uh, wrap up our discussion? Uh, well, I mean, insofar as you're doing these podcasts to get the word out on the conference and to, to kind of give it a, a richer context, um, I'll I'll simply say I mean I'll just return to our main subject and say that it it has it has meant so much for me over the years, um, and partly because uh, you know it was just down the pike, uh, which was, I just regard as just incredibly lucky in regard to my life and my career and and everything. But you know for me it it is um, it's been an important moment in every, I mean, it's like the high holidays, you know, it's even more important than the high holidays for me, you know, oh, you know, we're, it's in February, it's February, we're going to go, meet, we're going to, we're going down to Louisville. Um, that has meant tre a tremendous amount because really it has helped me um, think through uh, my, my work um, in poetry and criticism, and it has helped me um, it has been a lifeline to me at times, you know, in, in, in terms of connections to a literary community. I hope you enjoyed my discussion with Norman Finkelstein. If you did, please take a moment to subscribe to the podcast and hit like. And as always, I would ask you to consider joining us for an upcoming LCLC conference. Consult the LouisvilleConference.com for details. Thanks again for listening.